Is it okay today if I talk about some basic stuff? That was pretty weak. Can I talk about some basic stuff today? Stuff that I think is very, very important to us. And I want to I want to say something to you from the very beginning. At this part of Acts chapter 2 that we're at in this passage, we've been here for seven weeks, and we'll be here for one more. So it's eight weeks total that we'll do in Acts chapter 2. But one of the things that I believe is important for us, and make sure you, I hope you got your Bible, and I hope you got something to take notes on. One of the things that's very, very important is to recognize that the Word seems to speak to us all the time where we're at. It's amazing how the Holy Spirit takes and fashions things. When we planned this series, we had no idea where we would be today. We we didn't project that we'd be in the midst of a, a cultural war, social disruption. We didn't think any of that would be going on. But it's amazing how the Word of the Lord speaks directly to things that happen right in the middle of our lives. So I'm not today, watch this, my intention today is not to call you out, but to call you up. Hmm? Is that okay? I believe God's calling us higher. Come on, look at your neighbor, however how far away they are, and just shout at them, say we're going higher. I want to talk to you about the essence of a breakthrough. The essence of a breakthrough. And particularly the essence of a kingdom breakthrough. Now, it's very, very important that you understand what I'm talking about. Acts chapter 2 was the launching of the new covenant and the church. Let me say it to you this way. Pentecost is not a religious holiday. For Jewish people, it is a religious festival. For followers of Christ, it's not a religious holiday. For even people that are in full gospel churches, Pentecost is not a one-time experience. Pentecost is a lifestyle. Watch this. At Calvary, you know, let me, in our country, we elect a president in November. He's inaugurated in January. So he's elected in November. He's inaugurated in January. That means the power of his office takes place in January. Until then, he's called the president-elect. He may have information, but he doesn't have power. But the moment he takes the office, he has the power of the office. At Calvary, the new covenant was elected. At Pentecost, it was inaugurated. We'll try that one more time. At Calvary, everything that needed to be done through the blood of Jesus was paid for. But it was not in its full effect or power until the day of Pentecost. So on the day of Pentecost, watch this, what Jesus had birthed as the kingdom at Calvary began to be inaugurated and set in motion on the day of Pentecost. That's why those people who came out of Acts chapter 2, they didn't believe they had a one-time experience. They believed they had a change of lifestyle. They had a complete change in how they were going to view the world, how they were going to conduct their lives and how things that were going to happen in their life would take place. So I'm going to read from Acts chapter 2. We'll begin in verse number 37. The Bible says, Now when they heard this, that's Peter's sermon, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent. Somebody shout that out loud with me. Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you, to your children, and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call. And with many other words, he testified, exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. In other words, here's what he was saying. Watch this. I'm going to give you instructions on how to live in a twisted world. How do you learn to live in a world where everything gets twisted? That's the message of what he wants to talk about. It's the essence of how to live a kingdom breakthrough. Father, I thank you today in the name of Jesus for the ability to preach and teach. Thank you today, Holy Spirit, that you are the preacher and teacher. And I'm asking you 
to reveal yourself in this place. Make Jesus known to us today in ways like never before. Put me on like a coat today and wear me. To that end, I make myself available in Jesus' name. And everybody shout amen and amen. We often talk about why Jesus died. The reality is, is that Jesus died for our sins. We know that. Jesus came and paid the price. His blood was shed. The Bible says for the remission, for the removal of sin. But while we often talk about why Jesus died, very few people talk about why Jesus lived. If Jesus only came to the earth to die, he could have done that one day after he got here. His blood didn't get better with time. So if he didn't just come to die, why did he come to live? Why did he spend 33 years on the earth? For what reason? And it was because he intended for us to understand what it looked like to live in the earth from another world. What does it look like to be in the world and not of it? What does it look like to be a person who is covenanted with the Father and yet not influenced and overtaken by the things that are happening in the cosmos around you? He taught us, watch this, in the natural world, people will respond to people certain ways, but the ways they respond may not be how the kingdom responds. That may not be the attitude of the Father. So therefore, he came to show us what the attitude of the Father was. That's why, how many of you know he upset religious people as much as he upset anybody? I ain't got no help. I'm going to try that over here. He, he really didn't upset the people in the world as much as he upset the people in the church because they had already had a preconceived idea about how you were supposed to respond to everything that happened in the world. And when Jesus showed up, he didn't respond the way they thought he should respond. So basically what he did, watch this, he revealed their hearts by confusing their minds with what he did. I said it a couple weeks ago. God will confuse or offend even your mind to reveal your heart. Because what comes out of us comes out of our heart. How many of you know the Bible says it's not what goes into a man that makes him condemned. It's what comes out of him. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth begins to speak. So if you say certain things, it's not that, oops, I didn't mean that. No, that was in there somewhere. And so when Jesus showed up and prostitutes were caught in the act of prostitution or caught in the act of adultery, the religious world says she's to be stoned. Jesus said, I understand. That's what your law says. But those of you that's without sin, you can be the first ones to start throwing rocks. And all of a sudden there wasn't anybody left in church. Come on, somebody help me. I got a long way to go. We got to go faster than this. How many of you know the Bible says he knelt down and he wrote in the sand? He took his finger and began to make marks in the sand. People say, well, he wrote their names. He wrote their sins. It really doesn't matter to me because really what was happening was this, is that the finger of God had written the law that they were using against this woman. The finger of God had gone to a mountain on Sinai when Moses got the Ten Commandments. The Bible says the finger of God wrote in the stone the tablet of law that meant that adultery means that you need to die. So the same finger that wrote that law now dealt in sand and touched dirt. And he wrote in the sand, letting you know something, that my finger was not meant for a group of perfect people. My finger was meant to reveal people's hearts so that I could touch their dirt and bring them into a place of cleanliness and into a place of life. Somebody in the room today needs to recognize Jesus wants to show you and I a different way to live. And most of the time, he confronts us in our ideologies. He confronts mindsets. Don't miss what I'm about to say. Everywhere you go, you go there head first. How many of you know when you're born, if your birth is natural and it's in order, you come out head first? Come on, this is not an anatomy class. Somebody help me. How many of you know what I'm talking about? 
All the nurses in the room, somebody shout at me, huh? Babies come out head first, unless it's called a breech birth, which means it's out of order. Something's not happened, and it's actually more dangerous. So what happens? You go everywhere you go, you go there head first. Let me tell you something. If you ended up with a jacked up life, you got there in your head before you got there with your body. If you ended up with the wrong person, you got there in your mind before you ever got there in your relationship. Because everywhere you go, you go head first. Hmm? That's the re- Am I doing okay? Can I keep going? So the reality is, is that John the Baptist, Jesus, and now Peter. John the Baptist introducing the Messiah. Jesus introducing the kingdom, and now Peter introducing the power of the kingdom, all begin their first sermon the same way. All three of them begin their first sermon the very same way. And they begin it with this word, repent. Repent. They didn't begin their sermon with praise or pray. They began their sermon with this, repent. He was calling the world to a place of repentance. I want to talk to you about something. Listen, how many of you recognize that repentance? Everybody shout repentance. Repentance. Come on, say it out loud. Repentance. Repentance. Repentance is one of the basic foundational truths for Christ followers. In fact, Hebrews chapter 6 says it is one of the six fundamental truths that your Christian life is is based on. Can I help somebody here? Some people keep talking about going to next levels. They can't never get to next levels because they ain't got a foundation. They joined churches, took up Christian thoughts, but never based it on a foundation of repentance. And here's what the Bible says. The Bible says you can't go to next levels if you've never repented from your dead works. In other words, if you, it's, it's about you and I laying a proper foundation in our life. I had a guy say to me not long ago, he said, I'm just not into doctrine. I'm just into spirituality. I thought, you're crazy as it can be. I appreciate your sentiment, but you are actually revealing how ignorant you are. That's like saying, I'm into living, but I don't like my skeletal system. I mean, after all, I go to the gym and I got big muscles. Yeah, but if you don't have bones holding them muscles up, you're not going nowhere, Bubba. Hmm? So we ended up, listen, if there's anything, somebody asked me, what do you think COVID has revealed most about the church? One of the things COVID has revealed most about the church is the shallowness of what we really understand about how we operate in the kingdom. Because what happens is, how many of you know you can't, you can't preach live your best life by Friday in the midst of a pandemic? You can't look at a world that's in flames and in uproar and everybody go, this is four easy steps to a happy life. No, there's no four easy steps to nothing. What I got to find out, got to find out is, is my house built on a solid foundation or am I built on fault lines that when storms show up, my house is going to fall apart? Because I don't know what I built on until rain starts falling and wind starts blowing, but then I find out whether or not I've been rooted and grounded and built on a true foundation. The word sin, it's not vogue in our culture. Now, this is not about, this is not about so much about sin. It's about what sin really is because we misinterpret it. We think sin is what you do on Friday night and then you go to church and get clean from it on Sunday. How many of you know, watch this, you're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. I'm going to try that one more time. You're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you have a sin nature. How many of you know, you don't have to teach a cat to climb. Come on, Bishop, you're right. It's in their DNA. You don't have to teach a dog to bark. Why? It's in their nature. How many of you know that you and I, when we're born into the family of Adam, nobody had to teach us. Listen, you didn't have to teach your children at two how to have a temper tantrum. You didn't have to teach them at three how to lie. 
or 14. <laughs> Come on, somebody help me. You didn't have to teach your, your young men or young women that when they went out on a date that there were going to be places they're going to want to put their hands they shouldn't. Yes. I ain't got no help in. Nobody here is going to be real today. I'm, I'm going to be real. There are certain things that are part of the nature of fallen people. And some of the things that we have to recognize is that I have to learn to live from a different nature, but in order to demonstrate how to live from a different nature, i got to have an adjustment in my mind and my thinking, and that's called repentance. Hmm. Now, in the natural world, sin's been hijacked. There's other, they, we use other words in the natural world. If you are in a local college in the humanities department, they, they call it something different. They call sin things like injustice, bigotry, judgment, justice. You say, well, isn't that sin? Yeah, it is. It's a result of. Yes. I ain't got no help. It's a result of. So when we try to fix it through natural means, how many of you know at that point in time what we do is create greater division? Yes. Yes. Because my justice is more real than your justice. Right. So if, you, if you're in the entertainment world, you call sin suppression of your personal identity or expression. Uh -oh. Oh. Come on, you buy into the Elvis, Little Richie, Sex Pistols. Man, it's quiet in here today. I believe there are people online that are screaming at me. I can hear you, I can hear you screaming. Hmm? And you buy into this thing that really what sin is is when I get suppressed in my expression of who I really am. That's not, that's not what sin is. That's an expression of what sin is. Come on now. If I, if I find myself in the technology world, how many of you know I'll believe that the major reason that people are messed up is because their, their genes have got deficiencies in them. And somehow we're headed here, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just prophesying, we're headed here where through technological ability we will regenerate people and we'll actually make them a hybrid of what you watched on television when you saw the $6 million man and you're going to see people begin to be experimented that way because we believe we can remove from you. This is actually going on in England. England right now. They believe they have identified a hooligan gene. i tell you where it was at. It was when your daddy did not use the rod of correction. That's where the hooligan gene got in your life. If everything's a gene, then how many of you know everything that's an issue in your life, if we can just find it in your DNA, we could just remove that gene and you'd be perfect. But the truth of the matter is technology's never gonna make us perfect. Science will never make a pure human being. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Not a new computer, not a new science invention, not a new sense of technology, but when I understand what sin is and how sin is dealt with in my life. Am I doing okay? Can I keep going? If you're in the psychology department, sin is anything that causes you to be dysfunctional. And the answer for that is if we could just have you have a successful life, you'd be a wonderful human being. How many of you know that the truth of the matter is for most people, the more successful they become, the uglier they become? I know people that were very committed to their marriage until they got enough money to not be. I know people that used to be, people come to me and say, boy, those people in church every week. I said, you know what? I've learned this after 42 years of pastoring. It's amazing how faithful people are when they don't have options. But once they got enough money to get a boat and a set of jet skis, then they were no longer near as faithful as they were when they were broke. Come on, somebody. Because the truth of the matter is my success will never make me feel good about myself. There's a lot of people that get very, very successful and their self-image doesn't go up anywhere. They still feel inferior. They still feel self-judgment. They still feel like they're ugly. They have 43 different operations to make themselves more beautiful. And they look in the mirror and they still see what they used to be. Why? Because what changes our life is not by adapting my physique. What changes my life is not by a new job or a greater measure of success. What what changes my life is when I learn to repent. Yes. 
Glory. So here's how all of them began their message. Repent. For the kingdom's at hand. Let me tell you what repentance means. In the Old Testament, it had intense emotion. It was lamenting. It was grieving. Let me tell you what it was grieving. Let me tell you what it meant. It meant this. Please don't miss this. I may, I may offend David, but even before I offend David, I've offended God by offending David. Try that over here. Do you remember when, when David committed sin with Bathsheba? Do you remember that? He didn't go back to Bathsheba and repent to her. He actually took her as his wife later on. But when he went to the altar, here's what he said. Against you and you alone, O God, have I sinned. You have to understand something. When I mistreat Kathy, I didn't do that against Kathy alone. I first and foremost did that against God. Sin is always first and foremost against God. And until I understand how much it breaks the heart of God, I'll never understand how it messes my life up. Because how many of you know her and I may work out whatever. We may, we may have had a really strong discussion. I know nobody here ever does that. But when you got real high D personalities, they both can have strong discussions. Her and I, by nightfall, can get that over with. But how many of you know if I hadn't gone to God with it, yes. it broke the heart of God. Yes. And until I see that, I'm going to talk to you a minute about that in just a minute. But in the Old Testament, what they saw is they saw lament, grieving. They saw this intense motion, but they had no way to get rid of it. They had no way to get rid of it. Every year they could bring a, a lamb, and the high priest could go behind the veil put it on the mercy seat and for another year watch this their sins were covered but not removed but not removed that's why Jesus is so important because Jesus doesn't come to cover your sins well somebody gonna have to shout with me he didn't come to just cover them and say okay I'm gonna let you go for another 12 months that isn't what he did he said I'm gonna come and remove them from you I'm actually gonna take out your stony heart and I'm gonna give you a heart of flesh and I'm gonna take out your old nature and I'm gonna give you a divine nature and I'm gonna take out that old mind and I'm gonna give you a new mind so that you actually become a different species of persons you live different in the earth so in the New Testament, the word repent, everybody shout repent. The word, am I doing okay? Can I keep going? The word repent literally means this. It means to become aware of something that leads you, watch this, to a change of mind and a change of direction and a change of attitude. Hmm? It's the word metanomia, metanoia, metanoia. metanoia. You ever heard of paranoia? Paranoia is when you've got all kinds of influences from outside of your mind that's influencing you. You think things are going crazy. That's paranoia. This is metanoia. Metanoia means after or something that comes after you have seen something. Your mind has become aware of something, and it's how you respond after you become aware of it. How many of you know I can't repent of something I'm not aware of? I'm trying to get somewhere. Hmm? Somebody said, what is all this disruption about in our culture? Well, there, there's some things we weren't aware of. There are certain things people weren't aware of. They didn't understand how these things affected other people and affected our culture. So now that I'm aware of it, I can repent. I can't repent of something I'm not aware of. That's really weak. Because repentance, watch this, repentance means I change my direction. I change my thinking. I change my attitude when I repent. Can I keep going? Let me talk a little bit about what the Bible declares. The Bible declares that we're supposed to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength, all of our mind, and all of our strength. Correct? 
Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Well, how many of you know your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions? So basically, Jesus said this, I want you to love me with all your heart, all your mind, all your mind, and all your strength. Why did he say mind twice? Why did he say love me with all your heart, soul, which is your mind? Is it part of your mind? I mean, it's part of your soul is your mind. Why did he say love me with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength? It's because your mind has two capacities. Your mind has a capacity of memory, and your mind has a capacity of imagination. Most people are living their life out of a memory. Everybody's living under condemnation. It's because you keep remembering what you did and you keep disqualifying yourself based on a memory. Hmm? All sin to the, to the born again believer, sin is a mistaken identity and it's born of a memory. It's when you start identifying yourself based on who you used to be rather than who you really are. So you start living your present life out of what you did 10 years ago. So now you keep treating your present marriage like the problems you had 15 years ago in your old marriage. Hmm? You keep living out of your present opportunities based on the last opportunity you blew. No, oh, I'm going, I wish I had an hour right here because the truth of the matter is, is that most people have gotten forgiveness in their heart. They've never got renewed in their mind. And so because they got forgiveness in their heart, they're going to go to heaven when they die, but they're going to live in hell while they're on earth because they constantly keep reliving things that are a memory. Listen, when you get saved, your memory does not get amnesia. You can still remember some of the things you did. You can remember who you did them with. You can even remember how to do them if you really wanted to go back there. But the truth of the matter is, is that that is a memory. It is not a reality. And you can't live out of a memory. Well, when I was 19, somebody, whatever, fill in the blank. Well, thank God, you're now 39. Are you going to let the next 20 years be hijacked? Because 20 years ago, somebody did something that still lives as a memory in your mind. Love God with all your mind. And the other thing your mind does is it has imagination. In other words, it begins to envision you living a life you never thought was possible. It begins to let you see things that God has ordained for you that you didn't even know he had ordained for you. And guess what? You'll never get there if you don't get there first in your mind. Wow. I was in Oklahoma City before I ever got here. I was praying for some of you before you ever got here. I saw you in this room before you ever got in this room. Because here's, guess what? Your memory is about the size of a closet. If you talk to any kind of scientist, your memory is actually, it's very, it, it could be so much more than it is. But your memory is like the size of a closet. But your imagination, it's like the size of a universe. So I wonder what would happen to a church, church world, church people, if they'd quit living out of the closet and start living out of the universe that's available to them. That's what Jesus meant when he said, if you can believe, all things are possible. But if you keep building your faith out of your closet and not out of your possibility, then your life is always going to be restricted. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you know you can have a million dollar horse race, a horse, race horse, they just run the Belmont last week. You can have a million dollar race horse, but that ability for that horse to win that race is most of the time predicated on a $40 piece of equipment. It's called blinders. I trained horses all my life when I was growing up. My dad had horses and, and bred horses and quarter horses and we did all kinds of, of, of breeding of horses and different quarter horses and Appaloosas. I'd break them all some of the time, made money. One of the things I learned about horses is horses have unbelievable perif peripheral vision. That's the reason you can walk up beside a horse on the back and he can kick you. And you're just looking straight ahead and you wonder how do you see me because their eyes sit out on the side of the head and they got great peripheral vision. 
But here's the problem. If they're running a race because they've got such peripheral vision, if somebody over in the, in the field behind the, behind the fence where they're running the race does something or waves something shiny, the horse will get distracted and he'll get coldly off course and quit running the race. He'll get distracted by what he sees. That's why a $40 piece of equipment allows a million-dollar horse to win a race. I wonder what would happen to Christians if you quit having such vision of everything else going on around you and got a set of blinders and said, you know what? I'm going to harm is my mind. I'm going to quit worrying about what the neighbors are doing. I'm going to quit worrying about what everybody else is doing. And what I'm going to do is run my race and I'm going to let God work in me both to do and will of his good pleasure so I can be the million dollar horse that he desired me to be. Write this down quickly. I got to hurry. Listen, I'm almost done. Let me tell you what repentance involves. The essence of repentance involves this. Number one, it involves godly sorrow. Godly sorrow. I said godly because sometimes it's, our sorrow is not godly. Our sorrow is that we got caught. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 9 and 10. It says, now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. Watch this, verse 10. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. You say, Bishop, what in the world is that talking about? Here's what Paul's saying. Paul said, I wrote you a letter to make you aware of some things that you didn't know. When I wrote that letter, some of you got upset and even felt sorrow because you understand how you'd hurt the heart of God by what you did. He said that godly sorrow led you to a place where you said, God, I repent. My attitude towards that was not right. I'm going to change. My direction I was going was not right. I'm going to change. I'm going to shift my direction. He said, but there are some people that have sorrow that doesn't lead them to salvation. They have sorrow that leads them to death. Let me tell you what that means. That means there's a lot of people who cried that never repented. Coming to an altar and weeping tears means that your heart has been made aware of something, but it doesn't mean you repented. The Bible even says that Esau sought for forgiveness or repentance and his birthright, and he sought it with tears, but he didn't find it. Why? Because he wasn't willing to change his attitude. He wasn't willing to change his mindset. He wasn't willing to change the direction of his life. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, if I'm going to help you as a pastor, what God wants to do is he wants to make you aware of the fact that our sin, our our missing the mark, when we don't do things his way, it hurts the heart of God. But watch this. It's not only going to hurt the heart of God, it's going to destroy my life. Because sin leads to death. The wages of sin are death. Come on, somebody say it loud. The wages of sin are death. death. You say, well, that means they all go to hell. No, no, that's not what Paul's saying. Paul's saying this. Wages are something you work for. You said, I've been putting forth all this effort, and at the end of the day, it doesn't bring me a paycheck. I get nothing for all the effort I'm putting forth except death. You want to know why? Because the effort you're putting forth is religious in its nature. You're trying to perform to make God approve of you. You're trying to make sure you cross your T's and dot your I's so that you can be acceptable at the church house. But God says all of that, the wages of that's going to produce death. You never perform well enough. All of your righteousness is filthy rags. What I want you to do is recognize that when you don't do it my way, you break my heart and you destroy your life. When you become aware of that and you go, oh my God, I feel so bad about what I've done. He said, let that feeling that you have move you to a place of repentance because the emotion of feeling bad is not repentance. It just means you are aware that something you've done is not right. Here's the problem. Most of the people when they become aware is confronted with two choices. You can either resist and your heart will be more hardened or or you can repent and your life will take a new form. Yes, That's, right. hmm? That's why it's possible for people to spend their entire life in a church service week after week after week. God deal with them and they go, I don't want to deal with that this week. 
And a year from now, they're more hard than they were this year. It's quiet in here, but it's good. Hallelujah. See, I never know the depth of his grace till I know the depth of how much I hurt him. See, if I think my sin means nothing to God, then I'll believe his grace is really nothing. But when I realize I was created to be his image in the earth, and I've now broken the heart of God, but yet he still loved me. The only person had the right to say to me, Tony, I'm done with you, is God. And he chose not to. He chose not to. And when I understand the depth of his forgiveness and the depth of his mercy, then I understand what Jesus said when he said, to whom much is forgiven, there'll be much love demonstrated. Who's forgiven much, loves much. You want to know why some people seem like they can't wait to be in the presence of God? You want to know why some people, after 20 years, still got joy and rejoicing in their hearts? It's because they know the hell he dug them out of. They know where he brought them from. They know what their life was when it was a mess, and I didn't clean myself up by myself. I didn't even pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I didn't have no boots to pull up on. But when I didn't have any boots to pull up on, he reached down his hand for me. I was lost and undone without God or his son and he reached down his hand for me and when he picked me up from that pit and I know what he forgave me of see if you believe you were a good person and that everything you did was right you probably won't love very much but if you really believe that you were rotten to the core and Jesus who is rich in mercy has forgiven our great sin your life will forever be filled with love and devotion For the one who redeemed me. Second of all, repentance means this. It means that it's my heart's response to what my mind is perceiving. My mind becomes aware of something and my heart responds. John 3, 3, Jesus said, Nicodemus came to him by night and said, how does a man become entering into his mother's womb again? How does that happen? He preceded all that conversation with these words, unless a man is what? Born again. It's the only time in the Bible that term is used. Unless a man is born again, watch this, he cannot do what? See. Somebody shout see. See. Try it one more time. Unless a man is born again, he cannot See. see the kingdom of God. He didn't say unless a man is born again, he can't go to heaven. Because Jesus wasn't talking to Nicodemus about going to heaven. He was talking to him about entering into the kingdom. Coming under God's authority. God's rulership. There's a lot of people that have prayed a sinner's prayer and still live mean as the devil. In fact, there's there's sometimes I'd much rather do business with a sinner than I would some Christians. I'm almost done. Y'all stay with me now. We got to have a little bit more energy. Because the truth of the matter is, here's what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus. Until a man is born again and has a different nature, he can never see, perceive, understand, comprehend the kingdom of God. Listen, forgiving your enemies does not make sense to people who've not been born again. I don't care how moral they are. You're right. Rape my daughter and then want me to forgive you? Even the most moral, upstanding citizen would find that offensive. But if you see the kingdom, you'll understand that forgiveness releases life to me. Even the most well-to-do people in our city who support charities wouldn't understand giving away and being generous and giving 10% of their income. It doesn't make sense to them. 
Righteousness doesn't make sense to people that have a sinful nature. But Jesus said, once you're born again, you begin to perceive things you didn't perceive earlier. You see things you didn't see earlier. You understand things you didn't understand earlier. I didn't understand that my thoughts about certain things were contrary to God's ways until I got in the presence of God. And I want to tell you something. I don't have time to unpack this. Come on, team. But here's what I do know. Is I know that the closer and the more I pursue to be like Jesus, the more he makes me aware of things that are not like him. He makes me aware that he would not be blowing the horn like that on Northwest Expressway. Hmm? That's why every time I choose to get closer to Jesus, I become aware. And at that moment, watch this, don't, don't miss this, repentance ain't something you do one time. It's not a one-time event. Because every time I become aware of something that's contrary to his ways, my heart becomes aware that I have to respond. Am I going to change? Can I tell you something? Lots of people don't like to change. Lots of people, lots of people want to have Jesus as an add-on to their life, have some kind of security that they might go to heaven when they die, and still live with what pleases them. I've never found anybody that wasn't willing to, willing to live and do the will of God their way. Hmm? Lord, I'm, I'm happy to serve you as long as it is in this town, this way, with these people. I'm happy to do your will my way. And every time I get closer to him, he gives me those choices. Am I going to repent? Or am I going to keep doing it my way? Let me close with this. How many of you remember when John the Baptist, I got, I got so much stuff there I could preach. I didn't realize I got too much stuff. I could preach for several weeks. This is basics. This, this is the basics. Before we talk about, you know, going to new levels, this is, this is foundational stuff. You remember when Jesus, I mean, John the Baptist looked at a group of religious people who came out in the wilderness to see. They were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That means they were the most elite of the religious world. If they would be at the gate church, they'd call them the insiders. They were the ones that were in the leadership of the temple. They were in the leadership of all the Judaized community. People went to them for everything. They were higher than the mayor or the governor. They come out to see John the Baptist. John the Baptist is preaching, repent. Now these guys come out, they, listen, they came in robes that were ornate. When they showed up, you didn't have to know if they had gotten something from Versace. They had it. Hmm? It showed up everywhere. They come wearing regal garments. And when they showed up, John the Baptist said to them, you're a brood of vipers. You say, well, John the Baptist just sort of had an attitude, so he was just... You know, it's like he was saying, you idiots. That's not what he was doing at all. You don't understand that statement unless you go back to the beginning of time. Literally, when he says, you're a brood of vipers, he was literally saying, you're born of a snake. You're born of a snake. You say, what is he talking about? Go back before Genesis. In eternity past, God had a throne. And the one closest to him, 
according to the book of Ezekiel. The one that was closest to him, who was filled with all kinds of colors and splendors, musical instruments came out of him. And according to Isaiah, when he talks about him, he says he was the closest to the throne that you could get. But all of a sudden, he became lifted up in pride. His name was Lucifer. And he was cast to the earth. He was removed from his place because here's what he said, I will, I will, I will exalt myself above the heavens and I will exalt myself above the throne of God and I will make my name great. And God said, go on, no, 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 there's not your will and my will, not here, not in the heavens, not in the kingdom. Boom, he's gone. He comes to the earth, and the first manifestation of him in the earth is a snake. And John the Baptist is looking at a bunch of religious people and saying, you're the closest ones to the temple, but you're born of the snake. You're born of the snake. Because you want to have God on your terms. And the kingdom that I'm bringing doesn't allow you to have God on your terms. Because listen, God's not married to your political party. He's not married to your ethnicity. He's not married to your poverty or your wealth. He's not going to be married to your ideology. He's not going to be married to your philosophy. He is God all by himself. And the only thing that tries to get you to hijack God to be a part of what you want is when you, like Lucifer, begin to say, come on, boys, we will now make our ascent above the throne of God, and we will make our ascent above the holy hills of God. And God said, no, 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 no. My name is above all, and my name is forever established in the heavens. I am the one who rides upon the circles of the earth, and there is no one greater than I. And Jeremiah came by, came by and prophesied. He is the Lord God Almighty. He's mighty in power and he's awesome indeed. I want you to know something today. Every person that will humble themselves enough to say, God, I'll change from my will to your will. I'll change from my way to your way. God said, they that humble themselves, I can begin to exalt them. But those that exalt themselves, I will bring them low. Somebody needs to hear me today. That's the essence of the breakthrough God wants for your life. Come on, everybody stand to your feet all over the building. Hallelujah! I want to be tried by fire. Purified. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried.
to close in just a moment when Pastor Cole's coming. Our prayer teams will be available at the end of the service to pray with people. One of the things that I wanted to make sure of today is that we didn't push repentance into a place that was designated only for people that didn't know Christ. Because often when people make an appeal and say, we need to repent, we tend to believe, well, that's the people that's not walking with Jesus. But I want to suggest to you today, there are people that are walking with Jesus that we need to repent. We need to repent of our religiosity. I need to repent of when I did things to just look good with no sincerity of heart. I need to repent of attitudes that I have towards people maybe I work with, I live with. I need to repent sometimes of things that I am being selfish about. And when I become aware of them, I have to be willing to change my attitude, my mind, and my direction. Because wherever you go, you go there head first. I had to repent before God. When God said to me some things about I was leading the church. We finished. Kathy and I were living in Greenville. God said to me, I want you to do this, this, and this. And I was like, God, I don't want to do that. I'm making a great income. We're living well. To make that decision is to disrupt everything in our life. And if you'd asked me, I'd have told you I love Jesus with all my heart. But every time he makes me aware of something else he has for me, I'm at an intersection. And I get a chance to choose how far will I follow him. At what point do I say, God, no, I'm not going there. You know what? We can't repent as a nation for our national sins until we repent for our personal sins. We can't repent of our national attitude towards things until we repent of our personal attitudes towards things. And the more we become aware of it, the more we have to be willing to change. That's where breakthroughs happen. I believe with all of my heart, I believe I saw this, we're getting ready to have one of the greatest outpourings of the Holy Spirit we've ever had. It's coming on America. I'm not giving up on this nation. It's coming on America. We're going to see a harvest of souls come. But it's going to happen when the church, not the world, the world is not even aware they're sinning. It's when the church begins to repent for not walking in Christ's ways. So, Father, I pray today, as we get ready to leave this morning, we get ready to sow our gifts, we get ready to give our offerings, I'm asking you today, Holy Spirit, I'm not the convictor you are. I can't make people aware you can. So I'm asking you today, make us aware of the things in our life that's not like you. Show us where we're walking in ways contrary to your kingdom. Show us how we have missed the mark of things that would bring honor to you. And we choose today to repent. Lord, I don't have to cry. I just got to change. I got to change my direction and change my mind. Like a prodigal in the pig pen, I got to change my mind and go in a different direction. I thank you for that today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Pastor Cole's getting ready to dismiss us. I just want you to know something. I love you greatly. Next Sunday, we'll be online. And the following Sunday, we're going to look for great things to happen here. Please tell your friends to join us. So we continue to social distance, do everything we can. But we believe God's sending a mighty outpouring. I'm starting to preach into it in July 12th. We're going to experience a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen?
Just before you leave today, we just want to make a few important announcements to you. First off, as you give this morning, we have a few different ways to give. Make sure, uh, make sure you pay attention to those. You can give in the north lobby at one of our kiosks. You can drop an envelope as you leave. We just added this week, uh, we've been doing this soft launch for a while, but we now take giving through Cash App. So our Cash App is cash tag the gate OKC. If you don't know what Cash App is, don't worry about it. Uh, the people in here that do will give that way. So make sure you give there. Also, if this is your first time here today, we're really excited to have you. We would love for you to stop by our Welcome Center in the North Lobby, which is just out our center aisle there. Also, if you're online and today was your first day, our host there in the chat will let you know how to connect. But if you're here on campus, we have a great gift for you there in the North Lobby. And don't forget, next Sunday, we are not on campus, but we are online and we want to connect with you there. We want to find each other in community there online. But we wish you a happy week. We are praying for you this week as you as you leave. We speak God's blessing blessing over your life in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. You may just be, dis be dismissed. If the altar's where you meet us. As you leave, also if you need prayer today, our prayer teams will be across the front ready to agree with you as well. It's right here. My life is here and I'll be a living sacrifice for you you're a fire the refiner i want to be consumed i want to be tried by fire purify you take whatever you desire lord here's my life i want to be tried by You take whatever you desire, Lord, here's my Take whatever you desire.